so ladies and gentlemen, as uh, I say, I uh, reintroduce myself. My name is John Hill. I'm president of the British Bee Veterinary Association. And I'm delighted this evening to have Professor Steve Martin from Salford University, who will be talking to us this evening about honeybees fighting back against Varroa. Now, this, uh, um, uh, this webinar is kindly being sponsored by Thorn Beehives Limited. And I really do wish to thank Thorn very much indeed for their very, very kind sponsorship. Uh, and as I say, uh, um, I think indeed they've been great supporters of all um, of all meetings and of all um, webinars and all meetings that to do with beekeeping. And their sponsorship is very much appreciated. Now, um, I think really what we're actually going to do first, in fact, is we're going to uh, show a video just really of thorns. And so I think we'll do that first, and then I will introduce Professor Martin. Again, thank you very much indeed to Thorns, let's say, for their very generous sponsorship. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to really introduce the speaker for this night, tonight's webinar. Uh, it's Professor Stephen Martin from the University of Salford. And Stephen has studied social insects, and that is bees, wasps, termites, and ants, for most of his career. His areas of specialization are the hornet ecology, pest and diseases of honeybees, and chemical ecology of ants. He holds a chair in social entomology in the School of Environmental and Life Sciences at Salford University, Manchester. Prior to that, he spent 12 years working at uh, Sheffield University, seven years with the National Bee Unit, and seven years in Japan conducting research into hornets. Stephen is best known for his work on the varroa mite and its association with viruses, especially the deformed wing virus. But more recently, his expertise in hornet biology is in demand both nationally and internationally. His team of researchers at Salford, funded in part by beekeepers, are using the very latest molecular methods 
to read the genetic code of the DWV virus. The aim is to understand why some honeybee colonies have become naturally tolerant to Varroa and see this information can provide beekeepers with a long-term solution to the problem. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Stephen Martin. Okay, thanks very much, John. Let's just try and get this to go. Okay, right. that, does that look good for you? That, that looks great to me, yes. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, John, for inviting us and the almost 350 people uh, listening. That's, uh, God, I wish my students were that good at attending lectures. <laughs> uh, very impressive. Well, thanks very much for all coming and hopefully uh, this is quite an optimistic uh, lecture. Um, it's right up to date with what we're doing and I uh, keep changing it, but I've reverted back to this version um, for more of an international uh, audience that we have. So the topic is understanding varroa mite resistance. And it's by myself and currently a big input from my uh, PH, current PhD student who's just submitted actually, Isabel. And the work is mainly funded uh, by beekeepers through the British Bee Disease, which is a UK insurance fund, uh, the British Beekeepers, and actually also APSM, which is a, an American Beekeepers Association. Let's see if I can. Okay, so to understand honeybee resistance from the scientific point of view, not from the beekeeper point of view, from the scientific point of view, is that you really understand all the big players. And first of all, there's deformed wing virus. This is a thing that actually kills your colonies. Secondly, it's varroa. Obviously, without varroa, we wouldn't have any problems with deformed wing virus, as we'll see. Um, and that's the thing that we're all trying to resolve and everybody wants a silver bullet, a long-term solution. And we'll say we now have that. The honeybee, uh, as all people will realize, um, you know, they all have their own different color of honeybee, type of honeybee, um, you know, favorite race of honeybee. But in fact, they're all the same species as we'll see, but there are, they're all locally adapted to, you know, whatever their regions are. And in various places in the world, they're actually got some fairly, you know, unique uh, specializations, particularly in South Africa. The biggest problem in this whole um, bee resistance thing is the beekeeper. We know that beekeepers are individuals, they've got the ways of doing things. And if we've got a resistant mechanism or a resistant system, then it has to be applicable to all beekeepers, not just a small number. And this has been the big problem with bee breeding is that there's been a lot of money uh, funded to rear, try and select honeybees which are uh, resistant to varroa. It's not been that successful uh, so far. Um, but the problem is the beekeepers, they just don't want the bees. Um, if they're the wrong colour, they're not right productivity. So it's got to be something for every beekeeper. And then the thing which is in the bees' favour is this trait called hygienic behaviour. Now, it's not the hygienic behaviour that you will be thinking about, but that's the sort of a behaviour in their toolbox, which is critical to this story. So first of all, people think varroa resistance is something which is new. It's not. It has been around for decades. Um, I was studying it two decades ago in, in Mexico. Uh, it had been at least 10 years before that when it, when it first appeared. So in all of Sub-Saharan Africa and all of sort of Brazil, Central America and, and, the, and, and Southern America and then Southern North America, there is, you know, varroa resistant bees. Um, people will realize that in, in the Americas, it's, it, these are Africanized bees and they came partly from Africa. 
Um, but also more recently, there has been lots of uh, incidents of long-term varroa resistance. We call long-term is sort of more than 10 years. Uh, popping up in America, England, sort of all throughout Europe. And these are well-studied populations. And also for the sharp-eyed people on this, you will see three green dots, one in off the coast of Brazil, uh, one in Papua New Guinea and one in the Solomon Islands. And these are three unique populations that actually have varroa, but they have no deformed wing virus and they're, they're unique in the world. So we can ask that question now, it was, this is an old diagram. So we're looking at section one and what section one shows you is what would happen if there was just varroa in a colony with no virus. So they're not transmitting any virus. And this was theoretical. So we did some calculations and to kill a colony by disturbing its fat bodies or sucking its blood, uh, it would take about 80,000 mites to kill a colony. Well, that never happens. So we just, we thought they may be okay, but we just didn't know, but we do now know. So, as I said, the disease locations, and I was very lucky to visit one of them. So Fernando Noronha, which is this little island off the coast of Brazil, has European honeybees. They were taken there as a queen rearing station. Um, and the idea was just to bring European queens back and to sort of dilute the Africanized bees. But it never happened. But what we have is we have a small population maybe it varies between 15 and 40 colonies on the island that are European. They have uh, varroa mites, but they never seem to die. And we went there and we had them, we tried to check them out. And we turned out what we found is that they had deformed wing, vi wing, deformed wing virus was completely absent in these colonies. They've had constant mite levels for about 25 years and they've been studied by Dave De Jong. Uh, they've been looked at multiple times and he is one of the bees. And you can see quite clearly it's very yellow. So they're the original Ligustica bees. And these are the beekeepers, uh, Lydia, and this is my colleague from Brazil. And this is their beekeeping outfit. So basically a hive tool. Um, the bees are very placid, they're very, very quiet certainly not Africanized bees in that respect. And um, she doesn't, Lydia didn't really know about varroa mites. She doesn't lose colonies. Um, we looked at the, um, the mite reproduction and actually they only produce half, so 0.5, half of a new viable offspring. So that's a female offspring that's been mated per reproductive cycle. And that means in their lifetime, they're only producing about one or just over one offspring. So their population is literally uh, stable. They have some very high infestation rates, as you can see, between 20% and up to 40%. But because there's no virus, it's not really impacting on the colonies. Uh, we don't know the resistant mechanisms in these populations, unfortunately, because what I'm about to say we didn't know about that when we were studying these. And now uh, deforming virus has also been found to be absent in the Solomon Islands and in Papua New Guinea in the Highlands. Um, and both these populations have varroa and they survive quite well. It's a little bit more complicated in Papua New Guinea because it's varroa jacobsoni, but this is a uh, one that's jumped back into Apis mellifera. Um, and you know there was mul there's been multiple jumps in many countries. So so we know what happens if you basically have no virus, then the bees will become resistant. However, we don't have that luxury. We're never going to get rid of the virus. We've just you know been through COVID. We've spent trillions and trillions of dollars dealing with COVID. We've not eradicated it by any means and we just vaccinate against it I mean so it's exactly it's a, an RNA virus which is deformed wing 
So when it gets and it's red in this this diagram, so when either the adult bee or the pupae develop deformed wing virus, and we know it's a natural insect virus, especially a social insect virus, uh, and activate. So once the mites get hold of it, um, then there's a new mite transmission cycle. And this is quite old now, this sort of information. And so the mites transmit the virus to the seal brood when they reproduce, their offspring pick, pick it up, and the seal brood emerges and it has a shortened length of life. If uh, bees get fed on phoretically and develop the virus, they also have a shorter length of life, but it, it's not very dramatic. It's the damage is done in the pupae. And things are constantly changing, just like um, COVID, where we had the, the alpha, then the beta, and then the Omicron, Delta and Omicron and all these different variants. The same thing happens in deforming virus, but much, much slower. So originally we had the A, A variant, and uh, that's been overtaken by the B variant, which is more transmissible. The A variant of the virus cannot reproduce in Varroa. The B variant can reproduce in Varroa. So effectively, our countries have been taken over by the B variant. Um, we thought this might confer some resistance. It turns out, it, it, well, we, it might not be as bad, but it'll still kill colonies. So it's still a problem. And in the States, the situation is similar, but things are going slower. There is a change from A to B, but it's not going at the same speed. And even in Hawaii, where we did the original study, 10 years later, where it was all A, it is now sort of halfway between A and B, and I suspect in another 10 years time, it'll all be B. So I'm gonna park the, the Varroa, the virus story now. So that's at the end, and we'll come back to that towards the end. But 20 or 30 years ago, I was studying uh, in Africanized bees, the resistant mechanism. And one of the really key things was mite reproduction. And this is a very simplified diagram that basically in, in susceptible populations, one mite, the mother goes in and two mites come out, so two offspring. While in resistant bees, one goes in, one comes out. So it's, it's basically the population stays roughly stable. Um, and what you can do then is that if you look at the infertility across hundreds of studies, and this is what the, you'll see quite a few of these diagrams, and what each bar represents is data from a single colony, and they're grouped into susceptible, which are blue, and resistant, which are red. So these are huge data sets but it's the averages of which are more, most important. So mite infertility is the inability of varroa mites to produce viable offspring, uh, mated, new mated females. And so for normal susceptible colonies, it's about 20%, but for resistant colonies, it's much greater. It's around 45% from this data set. So there's a huge increase in mite fertility. We've known about this for a long time, but we never understood why. What actually caused this increase in, in, in mite fertility? And we do now know. And the other thing that a lot of people, including me and a lot of beekeepers mentioned, is that there seems to be increased amounts of bull brood since Varroa came. And this is this trait where I suspect nearly everybody here will have seen it if they look in their colonies sometime during the year. It's when you have the caps removed, uh, there is a living pupa underneath them, and they usually have, a, have this sort of purple or dark eye stage. So the, the pupae are usually of a similar age. It's very rare that very, very dark or they're very, very young. And this was always seen to be a bad thing. So this was seen to be 
um, something you know you need to requeen. It turns out actually we now understand what this is, and as you'll see, it's actually quite a good thing. So one of the traits, the big breakthrough, was uh, from a, a PhD student out of Norway called Melissa Odie. And she spotted something that nobody, including myself, ever spotted. And what it was, was that when she was studying resistant and non-resistant colonies and comparing them, she realized that a trait called recapping, and I'll explain that in a minute, was really, really prominent. It was prevalent in resistant colonies, but it wasn't that prevalent in susceptible colonies. And so they published a paper on this. Um, and then I got, you know, sort of quite excited and thought, well, if they're right, then if I go to a resistant country that like Africanized bees, we should be able to find it. And um, we did, I'll show you the data in a minute. But what I'm talking about, so these are three sealed brood cells, worker brood cells. And this is looking down as everybody does when you open a frame. But if you were to take these three cells and open them up like a tin of beans, so you're looking on the underside of them, we put them on a wire mesh just so we can get them flat. And look on the underside, you'll see that in the top right, it's just full of silk. So that's the silk cocoon. That's what's glistening that the pupae spins. And that's normal. That's what you expect to see. But the two cells lower down, particularly the, the lower right, have a big dark circular patch in the middle. And this is a sign that the cell has been opened. So the bees have chewed a hole in it, investigated it, and then decided there was nothing to, nothing to worry about. And they've sealed it back up using wax. The problem at the moment we have is that you can only tell this from underneath. We don't have a mechanism yet that you can do it from, from the looking down onto it. If somebody could design a, a torch or some sort of system to do that would be very grateful. We have tried lots of things and nothing's really worked. Um, and so that's called recapping and it's been known about for a long, long time, but it's never been linked with um, resistant colonies. And that's what Melissa Rodi did. And that was the big breakthrough. And what we think, this is from Marla Spivak's work, but what we think's happening is this hygienic behavior that bees have, that they can detect usually diseased or dead uh, brood and they remove them. And what they've done, they've adapted that behavior to detect varroa mites. And we now know it's a chemical smell. I'll put a slide on later. So some bees, bees which are very sensitive to odors, they detect that there's, a sm that there's something wrong in a cell, that that cell's infested and they open it up. If it's an infested cell, they tend to make a big hole in it. If it's a non-infested cell, they tend to make a smaller hole in it. Um, and then they walk away, they leave it. And this is what you would see the, the, when you'd see the bold brood. Now there's two other types of bees in the colony and it depends who gets there first. If it's a recapping bee, so these bees which recap the cells, see, oh, this cell's open, it should be closed. So they will then close the cell over and they'll recap it. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're measuring. But there's also other bees. And what they do is they detect that something is wrong and they will then remove by cannibalism. They don't throw the pupae out usually. They actually eat the, they eat the pupae down. And there's lots of bees do this. Once one bee starts, many bees join in. The mother mite, she escapes. So these are highly evolved parasites. She escapes, but she loses all her offspring that she's laid. And that's crucial to the story. So what we've been, what we use recapping at is the, shows the ability, or we think, 
to the ability of the worker bees to detect infested cells, to detect mites. So what I did then was I got data from places where there is no varroa at all to see what the recapping levels would be. And this is like your baseline data. In Australia, Colonsay, Isle of Man, and we've got some from Hawaii now, it's all a really rare trait. The holes are always very small and it's very hard to see. Um, and it's usually below, it's just usually one or two percent. So yeah, sure, if there's no varroa, they don't do it. They will do it for wax moth, uh, but it's slightly different. But um, so with, if there's no varroa, they're not recapping. If it's in a susceptible colony, so for anybody who's treating your colonies, this will be the situation. And the data here is from a population, so many colonies in Norway, one in Sweden, two in France, which is all Melissa Odie's data, and then ours from the UK. And there's two bars, a yellow bar and a, and a red bar. The yellow bar is the recap level of non-infested cells, and the red bar is the recap level of infested cells. And what's important to look at is a pattern. In every population, the red bar is higher than the yellow bar. And that means that bees can target, they can detect infested cells and they are opening them up. So they have that ability. It's just not that well expressed because there's not as many, there's much more non-infested cells than infested cells. So the fact that they're actually targeting these ones shows they can actually detect them. But then when we compared it to resistant colonies, so again, these are resistant populations from the UK that I've done. Melissa, uh, two populations from France, Sweden and Norway. And then I, I, my team have done uh, Brazil and then uh, South Africa. So two, two distinct races in South Africa, Scutellatus and Capiensis. And what you can see here is their ability to detect infested cells is really high. I mean, you're talking 60 to 70% of all infested cells are open uh, in, in many of these populations. And they don't just do this once during the cycle. It is done repeatedly because as soon as the cell is closed, if a, a detector B comes along, it will open it up again. And this cycle goes on and on. So, oh, so just go back. So one of the things we noticed is that why are they opening non-infested cells? And you can see that the more infested cells they open, the more non-infested cells are open. So there's a, some sort of relationship there. And we run, un, wanted to understand why that is, because it's a little bit odd why they would do that. It seems counterproductive. So Izzy, my PhD student, got to, got to work on this problem and she uncapped whole frames of, of seal brood and had a look and she uncapped every cell. And what she found was that actually recapping occurs in clusters. There's a pattern to it. And it's always clustered around infested cells. So this area here in the middle, there is no infested cells and there's very little recapping going on. But the two areas to the side in the, the blue circle and the purple circle, there's a lot of cells being uh, recapped and the little red ones are, are infested cells. And so what we think is happening, there's two possibilities here. One is the chemicals that the mites produce may be diffuse, hard to detect. So they check in surrounding cells or because mites often cluster on frames it's in, the, in the sealed brood, that the bees might be checking nearby cells. We don't know which one it is. A big uh, team in France uh, run by uh, Fanny Monday 
has basically spent six years and worked out that it's the cues that they're detecting come from the, we think the uh, op, uh, varroa offspring, not the mother, but the varroa offspring. And it's a mixture of, of, of four ketones and two acetates. There is a group from America think it might be alkenes. Um, but I think the ketone acetate data is currently the, the strongest that we have. We know that all bees can detect these compounds, but it turns out there's only resistant bees know what they mean. They can actually associate them compounds with, resist, with um, infested cells and then do the hygienic behavior. So in this sort of complicated diagram, I'll try and take you from the top, but if you get an increase in mite detection, it leads to two, two things, two, two traits. It's an increased uh, in recapping of infested cells. So in susceptible colonies, it's about 30%. In resistant colonies, it's about 55%. This is the sort of global average before we started our study. Um, and you can see that the variation is, is huge. But also at the same time, increased mite detection leads to infested brood being removed. And in resistant colonies, about 40% of infested brood is removed, while in susceptible, it's only about 22. Um, and then what happens is when you get in the brood removed, you lose the number of offspring. So this little funny line chart in the lower right-hand corner, all it indicates is if you've got a hundred percent of infested cells removed, the number of offspring you produce are zero. Um, if they remove no cells, you get 1.4 uh, viable offspring. So there is a, the more infested cells they remove, the worse the mite reproduction becomes. They, they produce uh, less females and that causes mite infertility. These are mites which have basically run out of eggs. Each, each varroa mite can only reproduce two or three times in its life history, in its lifetime. It's about 25 eggs. Um, and so once it's run out, so if it gets disturbed two or three times, it's not going to reproduce anything. So all these traits of high, high recapping, high infest, uh, uh, infested brood removal, high mite infertility, they're all linked together in this simple sort of um, system. So more, we put this together for beekeepers. So all the mite resistant links that we know about are, are linked. Increase in mite detection leads to increase in brood removal. Also increase in recapping, which is a lot easier to measure than brood removal. And that's why we often measure recapping. Redu reduce reduction in mite reproduction, reduction in mite and virus burden, and that leads to an increase in colony survival. And what's really interesting is that when we looked at resistant colonies, um, this is from Brazil and Mexico, over a 20 year period, then 20 years ago, the average infestation of resistant colonies in worker brood is about 20%. Now it's about 4%, it's dropped. And what we think is happening, it's yet to be proved, we think the mites are avoiding going into worker brood because they're getting so good at removing the um, uh, infested cells and they're waiting for the drone cells. Um, we just come back from Cuba, so we've got some Cuba data. Um, they've only just uh, became infested uh, in 2000, uh, 2096, I think. And now their infestation rate's about 13%. So they're on the way down. 
so it, it is decreasing and we suspect that in all these resistant populations eventually it will drop to just a few percent and the thing with the back to the virus the deformed wing virus um if you look on this very simple diagram on the left i mean it's only schematic but in a susceptible colony when there's a mite invades a cell and has the virus it transmits the virus to the offspring of the mite and to the honeybee and then mite offsprings then go into more cells and they infect more individuals and so very quickly the mite the you know the viral load builds up in a colony but in resistant colonies then the bee is being removed all the time now the bees do eat the infected pupae but transmission of a virus through an oral route when you digest it is very inefficient relative to a um, an injection route Nearly all our bees now have a standing load of about 10 to the 8. So it's quite a lot of virus, but they seem to be able to cope with that. It's only when it gets to levels of 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12, that the bees start to die. Um, and here we've got, so in, in treated colonies in the US and the UK, the, the amount of virus is much higher because this is a log than we find in resistant colonies in Africa and Brazil. So it looks like that the virus levels are dropping in resistant colonies or resistant populations. So what's happening in the UK? So we do have long-term uh, varroa resistance in the UK. Um, we have an estimated, well, you're gonna be careful. So there's, 3,000 beekeepers which are treatment free in the UK for more than six years I think um or is it I forgot is it six or ten years Alex will tell us she's on on the line um and about a quarter of all beekeepers currently are not treating in the UK many of them have just started not treating so in one or two years time they'll have to treat but there's definitely an increase in number of people that, that have decided not to treat. Um, the biggest population in the UK is in the um, North Wales, Lynn Peninsula. Um, there's about 500 colonies there run by 100 beekeepers. They haven't treated for over 10 years. Um, we have many, many beekeepers uh, in the UK that have large numbers of colonies. And one of the interesting things about the survey, survey that Alex um, did was that she found that people who are not uh, got resistant bees or are not treating have uh, um, between sort of uh, 10 and 30 plus colonies. So they're in the sort of larger beekeeper group anyway for England. So it's, um, it's looking good. And what we're trying to do now which are trying to produce information um, and to do a bit of social engineering to try and persuade people how they can move on and basically become treatment-free beekeepers. So I just want you to give you some data that we've done, well, not data, some information we've just had. So we've, finally, we got out to Cuba after lots of delays with, with the pandemic. And we were able to sample six colonies when we were there from Western Cuba, based around Havana and Pinot de Rey. Uh, these are my two students uh, I took, and we were measuring uh, recapping and, and removal rates there. Uh, the lovely picture here is their National uh, Bee Research Institute. Uh, bees are a very, very important part of Cuba. Um, they haven't imported bees for over 60 years. So it's quite a unique uh, place. And in fact, they have about 180,000 colonies. They are all entirely varroa resistant. They haven't treated for over two decades and they are European honeybees. Uh, the honeybees do extremely well in Cuba. This is a forest. This, is, this covers most of the island, but this is in the north. And these are unique forests. I've never seen anything like them. Um, if you zoom in, 
all these are actually palm trees. So they're not normal, not eucalypts or anything. They're actually palm trees. These are royal palms. And this is the fruit of the royal palm. Um, and when the, when the, sort of the, the fruit, the flowers, and when the flowers come out, it's a one to two meters long. It has thousands upon thousands of florets, produces huge amounts of honey and pollen. And I think the average amount of uh, honey per colony is between 40 to 70 kilos per year uh, for Cuban honeybees. And these are all completely resistant. Uh, we're also continuing our work in uh, Hawaii. Uh, we have a long-term uh, study there. Um, the reason for that is because it's the perfect biological experimental station. We've got islands without Varroa. We have islands with Varroa. Um, we've been looking at recapping levels on uh, in apiaries on Oahu, which has started this. So Dennis and John are two beekeepers which, which have never treated. They're collecting their colonies from feral populations. The dotted line is 55%. So these are well above what we've, these are all classed as resistant colonies. These two, Urban Garden and Wymanello, are actually being treated. Um, not so well, but once a year. And in fact, they can stop now um, because their bees are so good at uh, recapping and detecting bees. And Pat's colony, she uses drone trapping, has done for a long time. And even these colonies are um, uh, resistant. So resistance is now spreading quite a lot. And this is mainly because they have a huge feral population on the island, which disappeared and has come back very strong. The reason we were there uh, is to do a queen swap experiment. We've done it in the UK and we're, we're replicating out in Hawaii. And this is to help beekeepers. It's to decide if we want to propagate uh, resistant colonies. Can you do that just by selling queens? Or do you need the, the workers as well? So do you need to do splits? And what we've done is we've taken uh, queens from resistant colonies and queens from naive colonies so with Novaro, and we've swapped them over. So we've ended up with queens which are resistant, but the workers are non-resistant and vice versa. And to see what happens, eventually, the resistant queen's offspring will all become her own offspring. But if it's a learnt behaviour, as in like the uh, last chicters, bumblebees would play football. And if the bees are teaching other bees what these signals mean, then you need to have the bees there. So the preliminary data, and this is very preliminary data. Um, we looked at the number of mites and when the resistant queens with naive workers, the Varroa numbers were very, very low. Why, if you've got a naive queen with resistant workers, the number of mites is very high. So it looks like from this preliminary data that the queens may be important, but there's quite a little bit to go. Um, I know we're doing this work in two countries and Melissa's doing a big study in in Norway on this. So by the end of the year, we should have better data and be able to advise the beekeepers better. Oh, sorry, I just keep going. So what can you do to end Varroa treatment? Well, we're basically, we're in the process of gathering together a lot of the long-term um, non-treating beekeepers in the UK to try and get some ideas of best practice. But in the interim, I think the best advice is certainly do not stop treating. Um, there's a good chance, well, there's a very good chance your bees will die. What you need to do is allow your bees to experience more Varroa so they can get better at the recapping. And they're not gonna do that while you're treating. So we suggest whatever you do now, if you treat twice a year, half it. So you treat once a year. If you're treating once a year, if you're treating, uh, yeah, once a year, you treat once every two years. So just half whatever you're doing. But then you need to increase your monitoring. 
so to keep an idea or uh, an eye on colonies. Um, we haven't, we're, we're working on uh, like you know, more definitive things, what to do in, in different cases. Um, but the two main ways of doing this is either letting your bees go, which is not a good idea. And you can do this on a country level, like in Cuba and South Africa, and it takes about five years for them to become resistant. Or you, you start collecting bees from local beekeepers or from feral colonies, which are likely to be resistant. So just some quick do's and don'ts. I suggest you use local bees. So don't move bees around. Get resistant bees from local beekeepers or feral bees. Um, and then measure recapping if you can and select from the best recappers. Um, don't use re what are called so-called resistant bees that are based on dead brood removal. That's a pin test or the freeze brood kill because they're selecting for something else. They're not selecting. Varroa doesn't kill the, br the, the um, brood. Don't guess and, and don't import bees. Um, but and most importantly, just don't stop treating to start with, just reduce your treatments. So what we've been doing uh, is we've been doing uh, some practical things. We've got a practical guide now to measure in recapping rates, which is not very difficult. Uh, and, if, and basically those that really want to try, they can do mite removal rates and even mite reproduction, although that's probably a workshop, it's quite tricky. We've got an instructional video on YouTube or the BDI website. We produce this booklet. Uh, I think it's four pound from the BBK. Um, there's a lot more information that I've done. And then uh, most of the paper, well, all the papers, because they're public, they're paid for by beekeepers. We make sure they're free for beekeepers to look at. And if any, if you just had to look at one of these, I suggest this Grinrod Martin, the 2021 parallel evolution. And that explains the whole mechanism, how this thing all fits together. This is not me, I just the one that basically, um, you know, sort of manages things, gets my hands dirty occasionally. Uh, it's a big group of people. Uh, there's Alex that did the big survey, which is uh, currently, um, we're waiting to hear from the journal about this. She's now, a, she, I know she's on the line, so hello, Alex. Uh, she's in Goldway working on the bees. Um, Got to thank the beekeepers. Without all this work, the virus work, all this resistant work, we only couldn't be done without beekeepers. Um, and you know they fund as well, but also the funders, uh, my team. Um, so we've got Izzy who's just finishing a PhD. Georgie is doing an MS. Uh, George who worked in South Africa and the UK, and uh, Natasha who was in South Africa, and then uh, Jess and Laura who are both well. One's working on COVID. The other one's working on dengue now. Um, so all the funding that you've, you know, all these people have been funded by beekeepers and they've all gone on to get, you know, good graduate jobs in related fields. So I think I'll end there and I'll stop sharing the screen and I will try and answer questions. Thanks very much. Steve, that was absolutely excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's great to be able to come up to speed with all that because we've been listening to sort of areas of um, varroa resistance, uh, various mechanisms over quite a number of years. And it's great to be able to get this sort of brought together that it is definitely uh, really quite good news, I suppose, for the future, the long term. Um, and as much as... Um, uh, you know, we, we have potentially then sort of mechanisms to work to, to see if we can help our colonies. Um, and I think indeed, as you say, that uh, that is, a, you know, a really, a, a, well, really very, very thing to, to, to look forward to in the future. Um, now, I, I think, certainly I think the, uh, one of the things I think just mentioned just before we move on to the questions is you said something about wax moth 
they they uh, if they're looking for wax moth, do they tend to uncap in a slightly different way? Yeah. So so what happens with wax moth is that they'll they'll they uncap the whole capping, and then recap the whole capping because of course wax moth don't kill pupae. They just you know, they're looking for the pollen, so they're just moving in and out of the cells. But obviously the bees can detect them, um, whether it's vibration, we're not sure. And they'll open the whole cell and then recap it and they'll do it. So when we're doing the recapping, if we've got wax moth and we can tell from the frass, um, yeah, a, a lot of the cells are usually sometimes done in straight lines. You know, they're often lines uh, through the cap, through the um, of recap cells. So this is something they will do for for uh, for wax moth, but varroa it's it's different. the The recappings are small, uh, they vary in size, um, but they they rarely take off the entire capping. It's just they make a small hole, um, maybe about half of the cell if it's infested. Um, it can be larger. And if it's not infested, it, it's barely more than two millimeters. It's just a, usually a very small hole. Okay. I suppose just a, for myself, a, a second question would be, I think you mentioned is that there seem to be feral colonies where re-establishing themselves, I think you said in Cuba. Um, is there any evidence that there's re-establishment of feral colonies in the UK and Ireland? Uh, yeah, there must be. I mean... So the way that the um, beekeepers in the Lynn Peninsula in North Wales got started was they noticed the, the feral colonies in their woods would sort of come back after Varroa. And so they started catching swarms from them and realized they didn't have to treat. Then they split these colonies and gave them to the friends and told them just to get them out of the forest. And this is what's happened in Hawaii as well. Uh, one of the beekeepers we're currently working with, he, he was down to about five colonies. Um, I saw all the ferals disappear pretty much in Hawaii. Um, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of them in the mountains. And they all disappeared. And then we asked the beekeepers and they said, yeah, they're all coming back. And uh, a couple of guys, Dennis particularly, he just goes into the forest, puts swarm boxes out. And he's up to 200 colonies now in his apiary. Um, <laughs> he just keeps collecting and he never treats. And as soon as I looked at them there, yeah, there were high recappers as well. And we know the high removers as well. So we, we know in Cuba, we've just got the data in Cuba and it's 80% of the cells have been removed that we artificially infest. So, you know, they, they're very good at detecting removing these cells. Right, okay. We'll move on, just read the first question from Steve. And he said, I haven't treated any of my 10 hives for 10 years and struggled to even see a mite, two only last year. It has been suggested to me that maybe the mites in my area are not as aggressive. Are there different types of mites uh, and uh, some that are more virulent than others? Now, now, so that's what he's got. He's got resistant bees. Uh, it's just classic. Um, the virus is the same in Cuba, Africanized bees, Brazil, wherever. And colonies still die um, or can potentially die if things don't go their way. Um, but no, the mites are the same. The virus is the same. What's different is his bees. And if he starts to look, you'll find high recapping in his colonies. Um, one of the things that some beekeepers are doing, and uh, it seems to be a good advice, is if you've got varroa floors on, have a look for half-eaten um, bits of pupae that uh, have been removed from the cells. Because when they're, when they're removing the pupae, often bits fall out and land, lands on, on the varroa floor if you've got varroa floors. But yeah, if you just take a careful look, you'll see bull brood, you'll see cells being recapped, and you'll sell, see cells being eaten. And yeah, they keep the mite levels very low, or they potentially can keep them quite low. Yeah, and if he's been doing it for 10 years, you know, what, what's not to love? He's just, he's another beekeeper in, in that, now maybe have 3,001 if he didn't get in, if he wasn't in the survey. Right. 
Now, from Anthony, since Varroa mites existed on Apis serrana, what studies have been done to document the types of viruses that are being vectored by the mites? Are they the same, different, new, or do these viruses mutate like the viruses on Apis mellifera? Um, okay, so we, we know quite little about what's, what's happening in serrana. Um, they do have different viruses and they're, they're very susceptible to sac brood at the moment, actually, which they've got from uh, Apis mellifera. Um, the thing is that the, the viruses is not a big problem in Apis serrana, not deformed wing virus, because there's almost no mites infect worker brood. Um, there's been very few studies actually on Apis serrana. The, the Chinese are starting to study it, um, although you get paid for papers in China, so we have to be a bit cautious about some of the studies, but some of them are very, very good. But yeah, we don't know a lot about um, the viruses in Apis serrana, but the one that's key um, is deformed wing virus. Um, and it's, that's the one that's associated with all the problems we've got. It's the world's most widespread insect virus now. Okay. Um, here's one. Do we, um, oops, I just lost it here. Yeah. Do we, for breeding, select for uncapping and recapping only to disrupt the breed mites, or do we select for brood removal too? I ask, as I've read about brood removal, can aid spreading viruses? What's your thoughts? Yeah, okay, so this is, um, this comes up quite a lot. So the thing is, is that the bees will eat the uh, infest, infested pupae and they'll ingest virus, but they're already, most of these are infected with virus anyway. They have very good antiviral systems, bees, when it's transmitted orally, because this is their natural way that, that the virus passes. Um, so it's not a real problem. It's when it gets injected, which is the problem. If we didn't have any varroa mites, we wouldn't have a problem. And that's how the bees have solved it. There is discussions about bees becoming more resistant to the virus, but it's the mites. You reduce the mites, you re reduce the virus. So um, it's really just a matter of removing, removing uh, the mites. Uh, I lost my train. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I, th I think so. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, some James, have you tried ultrasonics for detection? I presume he's meaning ultrasonics on caps to try and distinguish. Uh, well, it's very small. Um, we haven't. Um, if somebody can find, we've tried ultraviolet, we've tried wax strips, we've tried to sort of melt it, we've tried all sorts. Uh, wax strips do sort of work, Randy's been trying it, Randy Oliver, um, they can be good, but it, I think it takes quite a lot of practice. And the problem is, is that some bees put a lot of wax on cells, some bees put very little wax on cells. And often you just pull the wax off rather than pulling the cells off because the silk's actually quite strong. Um, no, we haven't tried that, but yeah, it'd be very expensive trying to walk around with some sort of ultrasonic equipment. But yeah, if somebody can come up with a very simple way of being able to detect it without having to remove them, that would yeah. be a real advantage. I, I would presume you, you probably tried all sorts of wavelengths of light and things like that to try. Uh, no, I mean, because we're not physicists. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Next one is from Anthony. Um, are these hygienic, hygienic and resistant genetic traits more prevalent in different races of Apis mellifera, be it Italian, Carioleon, Scutellata, Russian, etc.? Also, do similar, smaller, more feral like hives instead of larger managed hives have more of these traits? And are more successful in dealing with Varroa. So this is the great beauty of this. Any bee, any bee type of beekeeping, any type of hive, any location in the world can do this. They just have to learn. 
Um, so let's see, we have studied populations from South Africa, uh, you know, this is including Melissa into Norway, sort of tropical Brazil, uh, subtropical Cuba, Hawaii, um, England, miserable England, cold, uh, you know, all these places, these are a whole range of different bees. Um, and they're all do it because at the end of the day, it's Apis mellifera. And the Apis mellifera is a single species and it has that ability to be able to, to use hygienic behavior, it's part of its toolbox to be able to develop it. All it has to do is learn to understand what that mite is and any bee can do it anywhere in the world. So that's really good news for beekeepers. It couldn't even be better news for beekeepers because you don't have to change your type of bees. You can use your own bees. And we think that you can, maybe not all bees can do it, like all individual colonies, but all populations can do it, that's for certain. So that's right. really good news for beekeepers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was really quite surprised that the idea is that there's a learning behavior uh, associated with this and that uh, seems to you know was quite surprising considering we tend to think of uh, uh, bees as being almost a, a totally instinctive behavior but they they are capable of, of learning behavior as well which i think is very interesting indeed right um from ian um if you have a colony with hygienic behavior removing infected larva would you see it as a less uniform brood pattern yeah, so if, if it's so it's not well, it's not really larva, it's a pupae. But yeah, if you've got a fairly at the beginning when you where your infestation levels may be a little bit higher, then you'll get pepper pot brood. Um, but over time that will reduce. And so when we're studying in some countries, then the, you know the I've seen frames of brood which are as good as anything I've ever seen, you know, wall to wall. And it's because there's hardly any mites going into cells. If you have an 4% uh, infest infestation rate and a sort of 50% removal rate, then you're going to get very few holes in there. But yes, you will see that. And also, if you look carefully, you might see little white dots in some of the cells that haven't been cleaned. And they're evidence of the mites have been in them cells. It's their little white fecal pellets that they leave on the walls of the cell. Right, okay. Uh, we have here one from Connell. Um, we tend to have an emphasis on brood pattern as an indicator of good queen, um, both for queen culling, replacement of nooks, and also for election of breeder queens. Presumably good recappers might actually be selected out by this approach. Maybe we should be much more tolerant of patchy brood pattern. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is, is I know some breeding projects when they discovered re well, sort of recapping they thought it was errors so they selected against it um because the problem with bee breeders is that they don't understand we've only till very recently not really understood the the system the mechanism behind resistance and it this looks like this is the most plausible system that we've currently put together and then so now you could select for it well you don't i mean you know it's quite easy to select for it while bee breeders are trying to select for many things at the same time but yeah pa patchy brood is not as long as it's not excessive it's what's the what's the cause of that patchy brood if it's removal of of you know infested cells that's good if it's because you've got lots of chalk brood well obviously that's bad and if you've got lots of dying bees from whatever, then, you know, that's bad. So it's the cause of the patchiness is more important. Right, okay. Uh, but Paul, who has a, a couple of uh, colonies that he's noticed do have some deformed wing virus bees. And he's asking, should he destroy these swarms, like shaking them away from the hive, and hopefully they'll not return? Um, yeah, so... If 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 the if the varroa levels are very high, 
uh, in, in a colony and you're starting to get some wing deformity, which is actually quite rare in colonies unless the virus loads are getting really high and the mite levels are getting high. You've really got no option but to treat. You either treat or kill um, and then restock from... Passed on by the queen. Uh, and no, queens. no, the, the, the queen can, you know, if you treat them, treat the colonies. Oh, sorry, Steve, I think your, your screen has frozen. Oh, sorry. You're all right. You're okay. Yeah, okay. Back again. Um, yeah, got you back, yeah. Is this resistant trait developed or passed on by the queens? Yes, we think so. But we think. Um, I'll, I'll be able to tell you by the end of the year. We have three experiments running currently around the world, all looking at the same thing. And the first preliminary data suggests it's the queen, yes. Right, okay. Um, well, I have a, car, uh, uh, a question which I think I could actually um, uh, answer. It said, awesome work, fascinating, thank you. Could you please go back to the penultimate slide with all the links? But what I can actually say is this, this uh, lecture has been recorded and it will eventually be on the um, uh, British Bee Veterinary Association's website. And it's very likely that they will, uh, but that they will take a little bit of editing for the, the lecture, but it will eventually be there. So these links will, in fact, be around. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the other thing, John, is if you just, if you Google, if you go to Google Scholar and just Google my name, these papers will come up. Um, I think they even at the university as well. Um, and then you'll be able to just download them for free. There's lots right. of ways of getting at the papers. Right, okay. Um, oh, I think this is one of the advice on not moving bees and say ah. how far is okay. And I think um, they want to know if they're going to move it to the heather okay. And I think that, so I think uh, that's coming up so probably in, in the autumn, people want to go to the heather. Yeah, so the thing is with resistant bees, we now know that you should not move them permanently to a new location. They'll probably die. And, and we know why that is now, is because if, you, if you're in a location that is that are resistant, then the ferals will be resistant, you'll be resistant, and there's a halo effect. So your surrounding neighbors are probably resistant as well. If you move them to a place where there is no, no resistance, what happens there is if you get a, a non-resistant colony that say swarms or dies and lots of mites come into your colony, uh, which you know you can get a thousand mites in a day that come into your colony if a colony nearby collapses, then your bees start removing and they will remove huge amounts of bro infested brood and if it gets to, depending on the time of year, between 40 and 60% of the brood, they can actually kill the colony by just depleting it of brood, by being too efficient, effectively. Uh, I think if you're moving it to the heather for a short period, that's not an issue, but you shouldn't move it and leave it there for a long period, because we know that when people move colonies outside their areas, they, they often die. Right, okay. Um, it said, what varroa treatment do you think we should use a treating only half the time? Uh, it's, it's, it's half of whatever you're doing now. So if you're using oxalic acid, go to half. The other argument is that if you're using uh, sort of, you know, chemicals or, or acids, then you could, you know, you could go to replace that with a biotechnical control you know, uh, sugar dusting or drone trapping or something that's, that's less effective. So it's still removing mites, but not as many. So that gives the bees more um, time to get, you know, to, to, to look. But it, the key thing is, is you've got to keep monitoring. And when you see the level starting to really rise, then you may have to make a decision what you're going to do. And treating them is no, you know, knocking the mites down um, and then, you know, letting them build up again. Give the bees time. It takes time for them to learn this. They won't learn it in, you know, six months. It could take two or three years. 
Right, okay. Um, well, uh, Stephen, you've been answering your um, questions wonderfully well. Um, and I think, indeed, there is a string of them left, but I don't think we're really going to have time for this. Oh, you're frozen, John. Bring up a subject which, in fact, I was hoping to ask you about one point because it, it mentions AAA apps. Uh, with all the research over the past decade or so, what are the next steps to create these super bees to deal with Varroa? Uh, is it queen breeding, improved hive management practices or what? Do we also look over the horizon to consider AAA apps as the next might villain for bees and beekeeping? Um, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, yeah, so I think the thing is, is that it's going to take time. Uh, this is a complete change in sort of thinking, uh, people's attitude. The people that are, are have for a long time not been treated tend to have been ostracised, particularly in England anyway, but in beekeeping groups because they're not following government practice, which still states you need to treat. Um, but I think, you know, with the science now backed up, my prediction is that within eight years now, that more than 50% of British beekeepers won't be treating and, you know, they'll be living with non-treated bees. Uh, tropical air laps, that's an interesting one. It, it's, it's a complex uh, mite. We still don't know its full life, its, uh, life cycle because it can only live on brood. Um, we've been worried about tropical air laps for decades now. And it hasn't really got outside Asia very much. So I'm not sure why that is. And things like um, small hive beetle, um, you know, that's spread to a lot of countries, but and it causes problems at the start. But then it seems the bees again deal with it very quickly. So I'm not really sure, you know, I think with these bees, if they um, can deal with Varroa, I suspect, yeah, they'll they'll learn to deal with tropical air laps in the same way. Um, it's just you know detecting different compounds. Uh, I suspect it won't be the same. Um, yeah, you know things will keep changing, but bees are incredibly good at evolving resistant mechanisms despite the way that we mollycoddle many of our bees. Uh, if you go down to places like in South Africa, you know, they don't treat for anything. They don't treat for hive beetles. They don't treat for fowl broods. And their bees are very resilient. They're you know, really tough. And it's because of this. Um, while, you know, in, 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 say, in the UK, we treat for loads of things. You know, we kill American fowl brood on site. Well, shook swarm for EFB. And so the bees just don't get the chance to learn. It's difficult when we manage them the way we do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I suspect they can deal with most things given time. Um, and anyway, if, I think with Varroa, I think we just get Varroa problems sorted out both before we have to start worrying about tropical air laps. <laughs> Um, it's just I remember there was a comment from Dr. Sam Ramsey who's doing a lot of work on trouble day apps at the, the oh, yeah. present time. Um, he, he mentioned, I think, a, a lecture that heard um, is that in the area that he was uh, doing research in, in Thailand, um, he said where there was trouble day apps, there were no varroa mites. It almost seemed to be is that the trouble day apps sort of pushed the uh, varroa mites out. He's, he's, yeah. Yeah, Sam, you're right there. I mean, we've seen this in Pakistan. So basically, they've got a much faster reproduction rate than Varroa. And they seem to about out-compete them. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, you know... <laughs> uh, but the big thing, and I hope, hopefully Sam's been able to sort this out, is that they seem to have an intermediate host, or they disappear. You know, they've got this idea that they only live on, on brood, and then the bees migrate. And as soon as the bees come back from these long-term migrations, um, then they're straight in the brood again. So 
you know, that's a big mystery. And hopefully he's been able to work that out. They thought to be on mice, but that's, I don't know, that's, you know, just one of them odd observations. So, yeah, it's that sort of period because they're not phoretic. They're not as specialised as Varora is. They're still the traditional mite sort of shape, but they are very, very uh, prolific once they get going. Yeah, and they do seem to outcompete Varroa. Right. Well, um, thank you, Steve. That was absolutely uh, excellent. And I'd like to thank you very, very much indeed for both the lecture and for answering the questions. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all the, um, uh, the all our listeners for uh, for being with us this evening for what was a, a fascinating lecture. And I'd again, we just like to thank Steve very much for that, but also to thank Thorne uh, Beehives for their very kind sponsorship. And I'd also like to mention, say, uh, we had two other webinars uh, in previous weeks. One uh, was about vaccination against uh, uh, AFB, uh, which was superb. And also last week was on the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan which is um, an excellent way in which communities can in fact help to uh, support pollinators and to help them um, keep proliferating in a difficult environment. So I would like to thank everybody very much indeed for, for listening to this. and to say that these lectures will eventually uh, be put onto the uh, British Bee Veterinary Association website uh, if anybody wishes to listen to them again. And so I would like to thank Steve again and to thank uh, really the Ulster Beekeepers for helping you support to, to run these lectures this evening and for the last couple of weeks. And I would like to bid you all a very good night. Good night. Night.